afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim Hay with NASA Value Point, and I'm the lead software development coordinator. And I want to welcome you to today's presentation for the new body armor products. Uh, this was led by the state of Colorado, and Nikki Kalin, who is our wonderful contract lead, has a wonderful presentation uh, to show to you today. But before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we are recording today's presentation, so this will be made available on the NASPA Valley Point website uh, later on today, and also a copy of the slide deck uh, is also available on the NASPA Valley Point website as well. Uh, please mute your phones if you're um, going to be if you're in a noisy area. Or actually, I'm just asking everybody to please mute your phones so we don't have any background noise as we're doing the presentation. If you have to step away from your phones, just please keep us on mute. Do not put us on hold. Some state phone systems have hold music and it, it, it detracts from the webinar. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Nikki Kalin, who is the lead for this uh, contract, and she will walk you through these new body armor agreements. So Nikki, take it away. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for calling in. Hopefully, after today's webinar, you'll uh, get some useful information out of all of this. We have been working on the body armor contract well, for about two years now. It started a couple years ago. The sourcing team came out to Colorado. We met with the vendors. And then about a year ago, we had an industry meeting. And we've pretty much been working on the RFP and the evaluations and the master agreement since that time. So without further ado, uh, the sourcing team members, of course, consist of myself. We've got Melanie, John, Tina, Jason, Rhonda, John, and Jeff representing um, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and Utah. So we've got a pretty good mix. And a couple of those individuals, John Riggins and John Desi, are subject matter experts. So they were very helpful on the team. And of course, we have Tim, who provided wonderful oversight on the whole process. Okay, so we're going to start first with the RFP process evaluation. Uh, if, 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 if you can mute your phone, I'm not sure if they can hear me, Tim. Okay. I'll see if I can mute Nikki. Just keep going. Okay. So we're going to start with the RFP process and evaluation and, and ultimately what led us to the decisions we made for the current vendors. The RFP was released uh, September 21st of last year. We held a pre-proposal webinar. We only had to do one amendment. It was a very minor amendment to the RFP. It closed on October 30th. Uh, the team met in early December in Idaho and determined awards then and over the last couple months I've been working on putting the master agreements into place. So we received a total of nine proposals, however one of those offerers was found non-responsive. Um, and this was the evaluation rating matrix. So what we decided was that we were going to score the proposals uh, zero through five. And this is kind of what we looked at as far as determining whether or not the vendor was going to get two, three, four, or five. Um, zero means they didn't respond to the element that we were inquiring about. One, of course, is four, two marginal, uh, three meets four good, and five superior. A little bit more information on how those were derived is off to the right there. Um, and these were the evaluation factors. So we put 10% on the executive information portion, 40% on technical, and 50% on cost. Now, we realize that 50% is is high for an RFP, but the body armor contract had always been solicited as an IFB ever since inception, which was about 2007, 2008. But because there were important elements that we wanted the vendors to adhere to, we decided to convert it into an RFP. That said, because it is a contract for good, it's, it's a little bit challenging to really develop it into an RFP in which technical is weighted much higher than cost. But ultimately, cost is still a very important factor in all of this. So that's why we have the weight we do. And we realize, like I said, it's, it's pretty atypical with an RFP to have weight such as that. Um, so this was the evaluation criteria. So under the executive information, uh, we wanted to see the vendor highlight the major features of the proposal. We wanted to make sure that they could adhere to all of the requirements in the RFP and that they would also agree to the NASCO value point master agreement terms and conditions. So that weight of 10% was distributed equally among those three components. So the team actually rated 
each of those three components on a scale of zero to five, and then we took an average to get to get the score for the executive information component. Um, the cost pricing component, again, as I mentioned, was 50%. And we created a market basket of about 20 different items. And that's ultimately um, what the cost score was based upon. We also asked the vendor to um, respond to non-market basket items and also provide their vest and carrier price sheets. The reason why we wanted to see the vest and carrier price sheets is because we wanted to ensure that the pricing they were providing in the market basket was in line with what they were actually selling the rest of their products for. So what the market basket looks like is essentially this. So we have all of the items here that we requested the vendor submit a response to, providing that they manufactured it. Now we got these items based on a survey that was sent out to all of our existing vendors, and we asked them what the top 10 selling items were. And we expanded on that a little bit. So obviously, concealable ballistic vest, tactical ballistic, um, concealable spy combination vest carriers, uh, soft trauma inserts and trauma plates were all very popular items that the vendors sold, even though some of them may not have sold all of these items. For example, some of the vendors don't provide combination vests. We did not um, we did not dock them in points if they didn't provide all of the items. We just adjusted the scores accordingly. And then we indicated what type of gender we wanted uh, the product to be, if it was applicable, um, the NIJ standard, and those are current NIJ standards and also the threat level. So the vendors responded. They submitted um, the brand and series, catalog number, filled in the MSRP bid price, and then it would automatically count, calculate the discount on the right-hand side there. So this is ultimately what the cost evaluation consisted of. This is what we looked at to determine the cost scores. Now down in the non-market basket item, these are all the other items that we're allowing on this contract, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But basically, what we said for the instructions on the left-hand side here is that if the vendor provides these items, then all they need to do is submit a percent discount from MSRP. So if they provide a K9 vest, they needed to indicate what the discount is for that item from MSRP. If they responded to all of these, then they would be awarded all of those items because those weren't a factor in determining what their cost score was. So basically, if they have these items, they're going to be allowed on contract. So that's the, that's the spreadsheet that they needed to fill out and ultimately turn in, and that's the cost component that I ended up evaluating. Okay, then we have the technical component, and that was a total of 40%. But what we did is we broke that down um, per, per question that we asked a vendor. We weighted these a little bit differently only because we felt the on-site response time, and I'll explain that in a little bit, carried more of a weight than additional warranties did. And I'll discuss warranties here in a little bit also. So these are the different weights that we put on each of these components, and that ultimately um, calculated to 40%. And I'm going to show you a few of these things that, um, that we evaluated. So that's, that's the evaluation criteria and what we were looking for. And this is how the calculations worked. So I mentioned in the prior slide, we had the weight on each of these components. Um, so with the executive information and then technical, that totaled 50. And then cost was also 50. So we had a total of seven evaluators on the team. And this is just kind of an example. This is not indicative of any vendor scoring. You'll see their scores on the next slide. But this is just kind of how that um, total was ultimately calculated, because we wanted to get to 100%. That's the, the top score would be 100%. So how we got to this calculation is we took the total points, which is basically um, evaluator one, two, three, and four, took the total points divided by the total possible points. And as I mentioned, the highest score you could achieve was a five. So that would be 20. That division then multiplied by 0 0.10 brought us to a calculation of 0 0.09. And we just did that down for all of these various calculations. So ultimately, that brought the vendors technical score and executive information score to a 0.34. And then I applied um, that same methodology with the cost component. Now the team evaluated executive and technical, whereas I just did um, the cost component because there's really no room for subjectivity in there. 
So, for example, again, scores 0 to 5, we have a total of 8 points here, divided by 20 possible points, multiplied by 0 .50, and we get a 0 .20. So, in looking at this score right now, the vendor has basically 54% total score out of 100 possible. So, with that said, I'm going to show you what the results were here. And you can also see that these are our awarded vendors. So the vendors that were awarded are Armor Express, GH Armor, Point Blank, Safari Land, Survival Armor, and US Armor, who are also the current incumbent. We also added two new vendors this year who are KDH and Renegade Armor. So as I mentioned earlier, there was a total of nine proposals. One vendor was determined non-responsive, that left eight. We did award to all eight of those vendors and I'll explain that, uh, the reason for that in a little bit. So as you can see, um, looking at the technical and executive um, component here, there is a little bit of a variance here, anywhere from about 41% on down to 26%. But where the big break happened was in the cost. And our original objective was to hopefully find a natural breaking point in the scoring and we certainly found it, um, you know, 86 obviously with point blank being the highest and Renegade 42, or I'm sorry, U.S. Armor 37 being the lowest. But the reason why we ultimately decided to award to all of the vendors as opposed to going with the top two or the top three is again, there really isn't a very consistent break in the scorings of these vendors. And ultimately it came down to this is a product that um, saves lives, people depend on it, and due to the nature of the commodity, we didn't want to eliminate any current vendors that states already have a good relationship with and that they trust. And again, that's strictly because of the nature of the commodity. Um, so for example, if a customer has been ordering from um, U.S. Armor for a number of years because they trusted their vest, maybe they've tried other vests and they just really like that product, we did not want to include US, exclude U.S. Armor and you know, eliminate the possibility for that customer to still use them. So there is, there is discrepancy in pricing, of course, but this is kind of a unique one-off um, national value point contract in the respect that you know, obviously you want to get the best pricing out there, you want to award to the most competitive vendors, but again, because of the, the nature of the product, we just felt it was in the interest of all the states and all of our customers and the vendor's customers to award to everybody. So, Nikki, and Nikki, if yeah. I could quickly interject, we, we also presented this to the National Value Point Management Board, the, the rationale of why the team felt it was important to award to uh, the, all the suppliers you see here, and they uh, unanimously supported the recommendation from the sourcing team. This is, as Nikki said, one of the most personal pieces of product that we have uh, available on our agreements. It saves officers' lives, and um, we felt strongly, this team felt strongly that we are not going to tell a, a police officer who's been wearing a, a you know, U.S. armor vest for years and trust it, say, well, it's not product is no longer available. So this was thoroughly vetted to the management board and, and they wholeheartedly supported the uh, recommendation. Yeah, yeah, and as did the, uh, the state of Colorado purchasing director. In fact, when we were out in Idaho and we were evaluating all this information um, and we thought, well, maybe this is the approach we, we need to go with, we all uh, were able to get a hold of Cindy Lombardi, the Colorado state purchasing director, and run it by her and, and she fully supported the idea. So. We were all happy. It was a long couple of days. Okay, so um, now what I want to cover is the new master agreements. Now these are structured a lot differently than the current agreements. Um, not only do they include a lot more product, which I'll talk about, but we're now holding vendors to additional standards that they weren't held to in the prior contract, and I'll explain that in a little bit as well. So there's still existing master agreements in place with the six incumbents. And those agreements will terminate on July 31st. So even though the new master agreements are already in place and you can start signing PAs on them, the old ones are still active and you can still continue to use those um, until July 31st or at least until you get new PAs signed under the new master agreement. 
Um, also, if you still want to sign PAs under the existing master agreement, you can certainly do that. Um, again, that's only going to be valid through the end of July, but because we have all the master agreements posted on NASA's website right now, there's certainly you know, no harm in, in signing the PA under the new body armor agreement as well. Um, so the old distributor list is still going to be valid for the old agreements. And what I mean by that is some of the vendors added new distributors to these new master agreements. There isn't going to be any crossover between agreements. So what I mean is if on the old agreement the distributor or the um, vendor has, let's say, five distributors in Arizona, and then under the new agreement they have 10 distributors in Arizona, and you buy product off of the old agreement, you can only use one of those five vendors. So the vendors that are on the current agreement have been approved exclusively for that new agreement, not the old one. Um, existing price sheets. So we've expanded the product line quite a bit, as you'll um, see here in a little bit, and as you saw from the market basket evaluation form, same thing applies. So if you buy product under the old agreement and the price for a concealable vest with one of the vendors is, let's say, $1,200, but then that same product is on the new agreement and it's now $1,100, if you're using that old agreement, you're going to have to pay $1,200 unless the vendor is willing to offer a lower price because, of course, these are still ceiling prices. So that's what I mean by no crossover of agreement. Um, also, any PAs that you might have recently executed under the existing master agreement, they will not carry forward to the new agreement. There is actually a state that recently executed some PAs under the old agreement, and I let them know that's fine, but once the new agreements get posted, you're going to have to execute a new PA under that new agreement. Um, and then sales reporting. So the way that Richard Carlson, who does the NASPO reporting, has set this up, is that sales are going to re be reported according to what contract they were sold under. One of NASA's methodologies is that they sometimes will combine all of the reporting for sales, so it'll just kind of carry forward from one agreement to the other. Just to keep things clean, and because it's the way the vendors report, um, it was decided that everything would be separate. So once that July 31st agreement is terminated, then sales will now just be under, under the new agreement. So again, no crossover in any respect on these agreements. Um, so the initial term is March 21st. Now that's when the first contract was fully executed, and that was GH Armor. The remaining vendors had their contracts executed anywhere from about the 23rd on up to the 29th of March. But we're just going with March 21st for the sake of ease. And the initial term expiration date is March 15th of 2018. Now we are allowing for three consecutive one-year additional terms. Um, it's a five-year maximum term. We will not go beyond five years. Um, that is in statute for Colorado. And we did not specify in the solicitation that we'd go beyond five years. So we'll be five years max. And what I will do uh, is prior to any extension period, so in this case probably December of 2017, I will um, send amendments to the vendors to get those contracts executed for an additional year. So in March, March 15th of 2018, we're going to extend through 2019, 2019 will extend through 2021, and so on and so forth. But I want to make sure that all of the participating states have at least three months to also extend their PAs uh, with those vendors. The last thing I want to do is, is have leave any of you in a bad spot where there is no coverage. So you can definitely you know, hold my feet to the fire on that one. I absolutely will be on the ball and get these extended in plenty of time for you to, to also extend. OK, so these are the products that are now under the new agreement. So when the solicitation was done five years ago, it was really just for uh, ballistic vests and ballistic vests that were sold as packages. So basically, you know, the original concept was that you couldn't buy a carrier separately, you couldn't um, buy, you know, plates separately. It all came together as a package deal. Well, it kind of morphed into something other than that through the years. but. In speaking with the vendors and talking to the public, we decided that it would be really advantageous to significantly expand the product line. 
So as you can see, we've got you know ballistic staff, combination vests. We've also included canine vests. Um, we've got ballistic helmets, ballistic shields, um, and then the accessories that go along with each of those items. Of course, um, all the hard and soft uh, trauma plates, you can imagine, are under the contract. Then we've also got protectors, um, shield windows, and we've got carriers, uniform shirt, concealable tactical. And then we've got various types of pouches, um, replacement vest straps, ID patches, carry bags. Um, you know, and then helmet and shield accessories. So we really kind of encompass the entire ballistic line. This award does not include riot gear, though. So you will not see riot gear on here. It is strictly related to ballistic components. So quite a bit more to choose from now. And of course, all the different threat levels um, that the vendor could potentially provide is listed as well. Um, so what we told the vendors when, uh, or what we told the offerers, rather, when they submitted their proposals is that the product had to be NIJ certified, if applicable, and listed on the CPL, if applicable, at the time of award. So basically what that means is, let's say uh, KDH, when they submitted their proposal, did not manufacture a combination vest. Therefore, they weren't awarded a combination vest. If for some reason KDH produces a combination vest, within the next year, they cannot add it to the contract. So only what was manufactured, um, certified, and meeting all requirements at the time of award is allowed on this contract. So you might find down the road that a particular vendor now has a product that wasn't on the product and price list. They cannot sell that to you under this agreement, and we will not add it. So. Basically, all of the products you're going to see in the master agreement for each of these vendors right now are the only products they're authorized to sell for the next five years. Um, what I've also decided to do is I'm going, we're going to allow product list updates once per calendar quarter beginning July 1st. What's been happening over the last couple of years is anytime the vendors wanted to make a change to their product list, They'd send it to me only to realize a few days later, oops, I need to make another change. Well, that's very cumbersome, not only for me, but also for Tim and for you as a user, because you never really know which price list is accurate and, and current. So you can count on um, product list updates once per calendar quarter. Even if the vendor does not have an update, what I'm going to do is still change the date on that product and price list to reflect July 1st or September 1st. That way you know you're working off of the most current, recent, updated uh, price list. And I'll show you here in a little bit what that product and price list looks like. So again, once per calendar quarter, they have the ability to remove products, add products, and modify products, with the exception of increasing their price. They can always decrease price. That still needs to come to me for approval but they cannot um, increase their price except once per calendar quarter. Um, or I'm sorry, once per year. So the product specifications are very similar to what they were in the last agreement. Obviously, all body armor must be ordered new and used, and often the distributor will come out or the uh, vendor will come out and, and do measurements. Um, it can't contain reused, remanufactured, or repurposed components. And on the labels, of the vest, and, and please make sure when you get your product that you are looking for these because this is a contractual requirement. Um, the contractor, the manufacturing location, NIJ CPL model designation, and threat level, the NIJ standard, and that needs to be a current standard, no old standard. Um, I did have some vendors submit a few price lists with, with old NIJ standards, and those were removed from the product list um, because, again, it's only current. Um, brand name and catalog number. Um, an area where the officer's name can be written in or sewn in, whatever you prefer, and of course the serial number. And we've also let the manufacturers know that they need to track all serial numbers and they need to be stored um, in a database and readily accessible. So if I or even if you, if your agency calls and wants to know all the serial numbers that have been sold to your office, they need to be able to provide that to you. Um, so pricing. So body armor is stealing pricing. So a lot of um, a lot of people aren't aware of that. So when they look at these prices on the price list, they think, oh wow, I've seen this 
at a much better price if I go, you know, directly to the manufacturer, I don't order off contract. But these are ceiling prices, which means you have the ability to negotiate a lower price with that vendor. Likewise, they can certainly offer you a lower price. Now, they're under no obligation to give you a lower price, but it certainly doesn't hurt to ask. And even though they might offer, you know, a great discount to, let's say, one police department in one state, that does not mean they're obligated to offer that same discount to another police department in another state. Um, I found that vendors have kind of had their feet held to the fire on that, but I, I don't see why they wouldn't because it would certainly benefit their business to, you know, make things fair and equitable but they're under no obligation to lower prices and then have to provide that same price to, to everyone um, across the country. Um, as I mentioned earlier, prices and rates are guaranteed for the first 12 months. Prices can be decreased at any time, um, and that's a permanent decrease. So even though you might get a lower price from a vendor, unless they choose to permanently decrease that price, I won't be notified of that. Um, and what I'm going to do is reach out to the vendors on March 1st to let them know that I need their new price list by April 1st. And again, you'll see a new product and price list with that updated date posted to NASPO's website around that first week of April or so. And also retroactive adjustments are not allowed. So if the vendor, you know, decides that they want to change their pricing, um, you know, they change it next year and they're like, oh, but, you know, we need to actually have this price go into effect as of last December and there's also, and there's already invoices issued against that, that's not acceptable. So prices um, are only good, effective, you know, when they, when they get changed, the date of that change, so April 1st in this case. Okay, so here is what the product and price list looks like and it is the same for all of the vendors. I wanted to create um, a very standard uh, universal price sheet because number one, it was an easy way for me to see the changes that might be occurring and number two, as a user, I think it's much easier for you to look at price sheets from each of the vendors in which the format is the same and do a cost comparison that way. So everyone is going to look the same. This is GH Armors. Um, you'll see the pricing effect. Date. So next year, if they update their pricing, you'll see the pricing effective date is April 1st of 2017. Same thing with all the other vendors. So what we have here is the description, um, the item, gender, CPL model designation, the standard, the threat level, the MSRP, discount from MSRP, and then um, I'm going to actually, no, I don't want to leave the meeting. That would be bad. Um, and then the quantity break. So some vendors might offer quantity discounts. Some of them may not. And if that's the case, you're just going to see the price in the one plus column there. So what we've done is we've broken it down by ballistic vest concealable. We've got ballistic vest and protector, since that's a tactical accessory protectors are. And then scrolling down, um, you see that they've got stab resistant vests, carriers, ballistic helmets, etc. So these still look vastly different than what the manufacturers were providing before, but we felt that this was just an easier way for people to be able to, to view the products and again, do that comparison amongst the vendors. And they all look that way. Okay. Now the warranty um, on the body armor, it's a five-year manufacturer warranty on ballistic panels and an 18-month manufacturer warranty on carriers. And that warranty period begins upon acceptance by the purchasing entity, not when the distributor receives the product. So if you have a distributor come out and do measurements, what they'll do is they'll then send the order back to the manufacturer. The manufacturer will, you know, create the vest, send them to the distributor, and if the distributor chooses to sit on them for three weeks before they deliver them to you, then your warranty period will not begin until you actually take acceptance of that product. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that one of the components we evaluated was warranty, but that was actually additional warranty. So five year on ballistic panels, 18 months on carriers is required, but what we ask the vendors is, do they have any additional warranties they provide above and beyond what's required. And some of them do, and you will see that in the uh, statement of work in the master agreement. If you want to peruse through those, you can kind of see what each of the vendors are offering that might be different from the last 
uh, contract period. There's also a ballistic panel recycling program. You are not, um, you do not have to use it if you don't want to, but it is available if you would like to. Some of the vendors will actually provide this service at no cost but the majority of them will charge you to ship those ballistic panels back to their designated location for recycling. And again, you can look at the statement of work in each of those vendors' master agreements to see what they provide and who will pay for it and who's going to require that you pay for it. Okay, so ordering. Um, obviously, specifications here. Uh, sizing measurements and final fitting are done at no expense. And improperly fitted armor must be adjusted or replaced at no expense within 30 days of purchasing entity acceptance of product. So when you get that vest, you have 30 days to determine whether or not you need to send it back for a free fitting. If that 30 days passes, then they're going to charge you appropriately for any adjustments that need to be made to that vest. Um, the documentation on the orders, and this is not only what the manufacturers need to know and the distributors need to know, but also what you need to know. Um, obviously, it needs to include purchasing entity name, location, contact information, order date, product description, um, serial number price, master agreement number, pretty much what you've been doing with this last contract. We just have to have uh, very good documentation in place so we know that these products are being ordered under this new master agreement. Okay, um, <clears throat> order acceptance here. So orders cannot be placed after the expiration or termination of the master agreement. And I wanted to put that into this slideshow because as, as I mentioned earlier, the current agreements are expiring on July 31st. So what that means is that you can't place any orders against that agreement after July 31st. There shouldn't be a need to since there's new masters in place and you're going to be getting the PA signed. But just so you're aware of that, no orders after July 31st on the old agreement. Um, shipping and delivery. This was another component that we evaluated the vendors on. Our requirement is that you have to receive that product within 60 days of manufacturer receipt of order. So essentially the way it works is the distributor comes out, takes the measurements, gets the order from you, sends that order to the manufacturer, and that is when that 60 days starts. So they have to then get the product produced, shipped to the distributor, and the distributor has to deliver it to you within that 60-day time frame. Now, some of the vendors actually offer better than 60 days, and you'll see that on the product and price list. In fact, I'll pull it up again here so you can see um, where it's at. Uh, maybe I can minimize this. So I can't really scroll down. I don't want to get rid of this, Tim, because I don't want to... Um, I don't want to lose the call. But basically, it just says over on the right-hand side, delivery time frame. This vendor can do 45 days if the quantity is 1 through 50. So you'll see some of them are even at 30 days. It just depends on the product. So that's kind of a nice benefit. And again, something that we evaluated the vendor on. Um, so the contractor can either um, ship the product to the purchasing entity, or they can ship it to the distributor, and the distributor can then deliver it to you. In most scenarios, what's happening is uh, the distributor's coming out, they're taking measurements, and then they're sending the order to the manufacturer. The manufacturer is producing the product, sending it to the distributor, and then the distributor is delivering it to you. But it just really depends on what your preferences are. There are no restrictions uh, in the agreement in regards to that. This is just typically the way it's handled. Um, all shipping charges and associated costs are the responsibility of the contractor, so you should not see any additional charges on your invoice other than the charge for that vest. Um, if, uh, if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if the contractor fails to reserve, you know, days in which you've indicated that product can't be delivered and they still try to deliver it on that day, you will not be responsible for any additional charges that they might try to bill you for. Um, and also, any packages that can't be clearly identified um, may be refused, and that would be at no, no cost to you as well. Now, billing, I kind of touched on this um, a few minutes ago, but essentially the way the billing has been working, and again, if you don't like this methodology, you can certainly work out your own billing with, with the distributor and the contractor, but essentially the way it works is 
the distributor comes out, as I mentioned, and you place the order through them. They then send that order to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer produces an invoice and sends it to either the distributor or to the customer. So basically, you create a PO in which the payee is the manufacturer, and then they send you a bill um, in which you're, you're paying them in return. And the reason why I wanted to mention this is because some people have been issuing their POs to the distributor only then to get an invoice from the manufacturer. And as a result, they're having to go into their system, cancel that original PO, you know, now make it payable to the manufacturer. So it really just kind of depends on your system, the way you would prefer to handle it. But even though you're using a distributor, Often things will just run directly through the manufacturer and that distributor is kind of the middleman. Um, <clears throat> typically, uh, payments typically made within 30 days following uh, purchasing NPC acceptance of order. But again, that just depends on you know, what your state's policies are as well. Um, okay, so for distributors, um, I have asked them to give me a three-day notification if they want to add or remove any distributors, and of course that has to be approved before the vendor can utilize that distributor. And I'm going to show you what this distributor list looks like because it's quite a bit different than what we currently have, and I'm very excited about it. I can thank Melanie in Washington for this. We have GH Armor's distributor list, and what you're going to see on this first tab here is not only the contract number, but the effective date of this distributor list. And I've let the vendors know that they can update this as frequently as they need to. But you're going to see how many states this distributor has, or I'm sorry, this vendor has. I'm not sure what that was. You're going to see how many states this distributor has, or this vendor has distributors in, and then how many distributors are in each state. So for example, because um, we've included um, um, a few, like Puerto Rico, I believe, is in here. So we've got basically 52 states and 141 distributors. Now, each state has its own tab. So if you click on that tab, you're going to see all the distributors within that state. And I think this layout is, is a lot cleaner than the current layout, which is in a different Excel format. I think this is just a lot easier to read. So this is available on the NASPO Value Point website, um, the entire distributor list is posted there for each of the vendors. So anytime somebody is added or removed, it will be reflected on that appropriate state tab. One thing um, that's new with these contracts <coughs> is I've decided that I'm going to do a distributor audit. What I've found is that there's some distributors in the field that are selling product for our contractors and have absolutely no idea how to use a master agreement and how to execute a participating addendum or even what a participating addendum is. So what I relayed to the vendors when I met with them about a month ago is that I'm going to conduct a webinar for distributors probably late May, early June. I'm going to do a training with them and let them know how these master agreements work, how the PA process works, and then I'm going to do a random audit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to periodically call distributors. I'm not going to let anybody know who I'm calling. And I'm basically going to just ask them a series of questions over the phone to ensure that they know how to use these agreements. If they don't know how to use these agreements, then there will be a period in which I might remove them from the distributor list and I'll communicate that to everybody. I hope that's not the case because that's going to be a lot of work. But um, I want to make sure that these distributors know exactly how to use these agreements and so there's no miscommunication out there in the field because I've come across that uh, recently where information is not being relayed accurately. So that's one of the new processes that I've implemented. So hopefully any distributor you go through will have a very clear understanding of how the master agreement works and, and what's expected from them. And this, I showed you the distributor. Okay. Customer service, this is kind of the same as it was in the current contract. Um, you know, the distributors and even the contractors need to provide full service and support during normal business hours. Um, and they also need to offer instruction on care, usage, and limitation of armor. Now, what you have the ability to do, because we now have eight vendors, and I understand that maybe you want to shop around a little bit. Maybe you've been going with um, you know, vendor A for a little while and you like their product but you want to see what's out there, 
you can certainly call several of the vendors or several of their distributors and ask them to come out and do a product demonstration. So if you want to invite multiple vendors or multiple distributors out for the day to, to demo the different products, you can certainly do that, and that is not a commitment on your behalf to purchase. And they will know it's not a commitment to purchase. So they might not get a sale out of it, but they still need to come out and, um, and show you the product if you request that. Um, along with customer service, another, another variable that we evaluated the vendors on was their on-site on -site response. And this is a new component of the contract as well. So the on-site response time, what we did is we asked the vendors if they get a call from a customer and the customer wants them to come out and do a fitting, how long will it take them to get to that customer's location based upon the quantity of vests that they're ordering? So for example, again, this is GH Armor. If you were to contact um, one of GH Armor's distributors or even GH Armor, and that distributor was less than 50 miles from your location and you wanted to do a fitting for 100 or more vests, it'll take that distributor two business days to reach you. On the other hand, if you call that distributor and you want to have anywhere from 1 to 19 vests fitted, it's going to take them five business days to reach you. So we've broken it down in less than 50 miles, 50 to 100 miles, um, 100 to 150 and then greater than 150 because, you know, understandably, the further away the distributor is, the longer it might take them to reach you. That doesn't appear to be the case with um, GH Armor, however, because as you can see, if you're located less than 50 miles from a distributor or more than 150 miles from a distributor and you want to place an order of over 100 vests, it's still only going to take them two business days to reach you. And this is the standard that we are holding these vendors to, their distributors to. So if you're finding that they are not adhering to this time frame, then please let me know. And you will find the on-site response time for all of these vendors attached as an exhibit in the back of the master agreement. The on-site response time is, of course, different for all of the vendors. So please make sure you take a look at that. And again, if they're not fulfilling um, this obligation, please let me know. So that is uh, the on-site response time, again, a new element that we've included in the master agreement. And, and that, that is all I have. Now, Tim wanted me to mention that he'd like to reserve questions for the end. He's going to go through the participating addendum process. So with that said, I'll let Tim take it from here. All righty. Thank you very much, Nikki. Great presentation. So you should see on your screen the uh, participating addendum process slides right now. Uh, just going to quickly talk you through how the NASPO value point participating in the process works. So as you're aware, uh, NASPO has executed a memorandum of agreement with all 50 states and the District of Columbia, as well as the U.S. territories. That allows them to be eligible to use any of our NASPO value point master agreements. We have about 52, 53 portfolios right now, and all of those contracts are available for use uh, if those states choose to use them. There's three options for uh, participation from the states. Uh, we always like option number one, where a state will execute a participating addendum for their state use as well as all the political subdivisions within their states. Sometimes a state may not be able to utilize the agreements that we have available to them, but they have no problem if they have political subdivisions in their state wants to utilize those agreements. So they would then do option number two where they would sign a participating addendum just for the political subdivision use only. And then there are other situations where a state may, may, may not be able to execute a participating addendum at all. Um, but that doesn't mean that the political subdivisions within that state are out out in the cold. We still have an, an option to have our contracts available to them. However, we have to do a check-in process with the chief procurement officer in that state. And the reason, reason for that is we are a state-owned and operated cooperative purchasing organization. As I mentioned earlier, we're owned and operated by NASCO. We are not going to go in and compete with any state that has an in-state purchasing cooperative with our agreement. So, uh, for example, say uh, the state of, um, I'll just pick on another state, the state of Nebraska has their own in-state cooperative for body armor and the state uh, or the city of Lincoln wants to participate, we would first check in with the chief procurement officer in that state to make sure that they don't have any objections. 
And they may say, well, we've got our own internal cooperative that we would like for the city of Lincoln to purchase off of. So they would say, sorry, we, we, we do object to this. And, and we would then notify you know, the, the, the city of Lincoln accordingly. 99% of the time, though, the state chief procurement officers usually don't have any objection to uh, political subdivisions executing participating addendums. But we still have to do that check-in process. And that's the sole reason why we do that just to make sure we're not competing with any in-state cooperatives that they may have. So the step-by-step -step, uh, uh, process for executing PAs is similar for both one and two. And I'm not going to read this ver verbatim, but it primarily says that once you select the contractor or contractors you want to use, you would just negotiate directly with that contractor to execute your participating addendum. Uh, the state of Colorado, Nikki, nor does NASA Value Point get involved in your negotiations or approve your participating addendums. We're certainly here to answer any questions that you may have. If, if you have a, a master agreement interpretation issue, if you're not sure of something uh, of how of a term or condition or how the master agreement works, Nikki is the person that you want to contact. If you've got a participating addendum process question or just a uh, master value point question in general about our processes and procedures, certainly reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to answer the question for you or I will get you in contact with the appropriate person within master value point to address your question. Uh, once you have that participating addendum negotiated and executed, you would just send in a copy of that PA, uh, preferably in a PDF format with signatures from both parties to uh, our generic email address of pa at nasvovaluepoint.org. So opportunity number three is very similar. However, we just have that check-in process with the state CPO. So if there's a, a political subdivision that wants to execute a PA, they will typically reach out to us. Or sometimes maybe the contractor is talking with the a city. And uh, they'll reach out to us and say, hey, we have a city that's interested. What we'll do then is we will contact the chief procurement officer on that city's behalf, indicating their interest in executing a participating addendum. And we'll, uh, we'll loop in the, uh, the point of contact for the city, and we'll even loop in the point of contact for the contractor as well if they're involved in that. And just so they're aware that we've you know, initiated the communication with the chief procurement officer, and we'll certainly uh, forward the communication that we receive back from the, the, the chief procurement officer, whether they do or do not have any objections. And then once we've gone through that process, provided they have no objections, then the, the process would still be the same. The political subdivision would just negotiate the PA directly with the contractor, and then that uh, PA would be sent in to us uh, for posting on the website. We have this uh, flow chart on every portfolio page in the NASA Value Point website. It just uh, uh, shows the steps involved in executing the participating addendum. Just a couple of things to remember. We do have sample uh, participating addendums located on the NASA Value Point website that are personalized for each of the contractors. So if you go to the NASA Value Point website, um, and if you were to click on body armor, um, you will see this is the general portfolio information here and Nikki's contact information. We do have all of the contractor information loaded on the website now. You would just click on the contractor of your choice, and the model participating addendum is located right here. Uh, and it's in a Word document, so you can just download that and initiate your uh, negotiations. You have the ability to negotiate in additional items uh, that may be pr uh, important to your state. Um, if your state charges an admin fee, if that's how you help fund your purchasing office, you can certainly add in an admin fee. If you have any additional reporting requirements or if you have any of those unique terms and conditions that you have to have in all of your contracts, you have a spot in that participating addendum uh, to add those additional T's and C's. I believe it's Section 3. And we're really reserving that Section 3 for states to enter their additional P's and C's. Uh, we have had some issues with some of the other contract portfolios where contractors will try to come in and, and renegotiate everything using that uh, Section 3. We're really trying to emphasize to the contractors that we're trying to keep the master agreements uh, true to the form as they were negotiated and that we're reserving that spot to, for only the states. Um, once we do receive a copy of the participating addendum, we will post all of those up on the National Value Point website. 
Uh, we have the, our famous NAP, and that will continue to populate as more and more states execute PAs. As you saw on the website already, we already have uh, five states that have already executed participating addendums, and we're hoping to have even more. All of the information is now available on the National Value Point website, so we encourage you to uh, go take a look at that. Um, with that, uh, I'll open it up to any questions uh, that you may have for either Nikki or myself. Anyone? Okay, well, Anyone? <laughs> I'm, hear I'm hearing Wait. no questions. Wait a minute. This is Pam. <laughs> okay, Pam. Hi, hey, just a quick qu Hi. <laughs> quick question. I'm looking at the NASPA Value Point site, and I'm looking at Armor Express. And I don't see a uh, distributor list. Uh, let me jump on there real quick. <clears throat> Tim can probably beat me to it. But hey, hey, Nikki, that may be the one. I've been having some problems getting some documents yeah. from Nikki. They have some secure system that's not letting some documents go through, and that may be the one uh, that mm -hmm. I haven't received a distributor you, list. From. Yeah, you know what, Tim. Um, that was the one. So you and I can talk offline about that. <laughs> but Pam, um, we'll get that up for you um, ASAP. I wasn't aware that it wasn't okay. there. But we were having some problems. My emails were being encrypted uh, because of certain language that was in the, the files, even though it didn't happen for the other vendors. And as a result, Tim wasn't able to, to open up the files. I, I think we both thought that had been resolved, but apparently uh -huh. it hasn't. So we'll get that Well, so, so just quit using those cuss words. I know, right? Well, what's funny is it was, it was being encrypted because of the FEIN numbers oh. in the distributor list, but it wasn't happening for any of the other vendors. So I'm not sure what the Armor Express trigger was because it's no huh. different for anybody else. But maybe wow. it's just my well, 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 yeah, we'll figure out a workaround to, to get that yeah. file up, Pam. So I appreciate yeah. you calling yeah. that to our attention. Okay. So I looked any, at all the other ones and everything seemed to be consistent. So. Um, that was the only one I noticed that was kind of missing that one thing. Okay, okay th thank thanks, you. For, thanks for mentioning that. Any then, other um, one other quick thing is for the people that are on the call that are in the state of Oregon, that are from the state of Oregon, or that are part of the my, my group, uh, we'll talk offline about this. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Good. Okay. okay. If there's, okay. Any other questions from any other states? Um, the only well, thing I think I would like to add, Tim, is um, I would really encourage everybody to at least look at the statement of work um, in these master agreements. And I, I know it's no fun to read contracts, but that way you're going to know exactly what products are available under that master agreement what the warranty the vendor is offering is, what their recycling plan is, and most importantly, what their on-site response time is. So if you can just take a few minutes to look at the statement of work and the master agreements, I, I would really encourage everyone to do that because I do want to hold these vendors to these standards we've put in place, and you as the customers are, are really the only ones that can let me know whether or not that's happening. So I just wanted to mention that. Already, thank you, Nikki. And Hi, with this that, is Cheryl. I Wait, this is Cheryl, Cheryl from Pennsylvania. I have a question. So you uh -huh. had indicated that at the time of award that you were only allowing them to include um, from the manufacturer's line products that were certified at the time of award. But then you indicated. Um, but then you on. indicated. You indicated that um, once per quarter that they can put in new product list. How, how can you keep them from adding new product lines when they're giving you new product lists? How, how are you be monitoring that to, to know that they're not putting new products on that weren't certified at the time of award? Okay, so we've broken it down into product categories. So a product category, for example, is a ballistic concealable vest. Another product category is canine vest. So they can continue to add um, any line, any upgrade of ballistic concealable vests, but they can't add a product category that wasn't already approved. So what, I'm, what I mean by that is if they were approved for ballistic concealable vests 
and in the next year they came out with 20 new models of ballistic concealable vests. They can add those. That's not a problem. What they can't do is add a category that they weren't oh, okay. approved for. So okay, if they I'm weren't approved, you. yeah, and I'm glad you asked that question. It's a good question. So if they weren't approved for um, concealable vests, and now they manufacture, or I'm, I'm sorry, if they weren't approved for combination vests, and now they manufacture combination vests, they can't add that. So the product categories on those price sheets are that long yellow line. That's the product sure. category, but then they can add as much stuff under that as they want to. And the way I'm tracking it is I've required them to send me any changes um, in red line. I've also locked down cells that they can't manipulate. So I'll have a, a good grasp on what's being added and removed. OK, thank you. Sure. Okay. I'm glad you asked with, Thank you. Yeah, great question. And with that, we're, we've reached the end of our time today. Just a reminder that this uh, presentation will be posted up on the NASA Value Point website later on today, so you could go back and review it at your pleasure. And I just want to thank Nikki for her hard work. She has been a rock star uh, lead, uh, lead contract analyst in this category. So Nikki, just thank you for all your hard work, and thanks to the sourcing team for all their hard work as well and input on this uh, wonderful agreement. Uh, as Nikki mentioned, everything is now available up on the website, and we encourage you to utilize these agreements. And feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And with that, I just want to wish you all a great day.